Hi, I'm Dan Small. Welcome to Deer Hunt Wisconsin 2014. This is our 23rd annual special designed to provide you with the latest information on deer hunting here in Wisconsin as you prepare for your hunt. If you pay attention to deer management in Wisconsin, you should have heard a lot of talk over the past two years about Wisconsin's Deer Trustee Report and the changes it recommended. You'll find a lot of the rules have changed, but the changes are not all that complicated, and they're designed to improve your hunting experience and provide you with more opportunity to get involved in deer management. Our goal in this hour is to help you understand what's new for this fall that may affect your hunt. Focus on where you hunt and you'll get the picture. We think you'll find this is an exciting time to be a deer hunter in Wisconsin. The rules may have changed, but the tradition remains. Throughout the program, you'll see the phone number for the DNR call center on your screen. You can call this number seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. and ask a staff person any question you might have about deer hunting in English, Spanish, or Hmong. During those same hours, you can also get your questions answered in an online chat or email. If you have a cell phone, you can even call or email the call center from the field. And if you've got a smartphone, you can download the DNR's free mobile app with features like GPS mapping, places to hunt on public land, season dates and regulations, legal shooting hours, and even a trophy case for sharing your photos instantly with a community of hunters. It's a free download from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Search for Wisconsin Pocket Ranger. You can learn more at dnr.wi.gov, keywords mobile app. Every year on this show, we look forward to talking with DNR Secretary Kathy Stepp about deer hunting. And Kathy, you had another successful season last year. I am three for three now. So yeah, it was a wild year last year. Again, I can't wait to get out this year. There are a lot of new rules. The exciting thing about this, and I know change is always stressful for people, especially when we're talking about long held traditions and deer hunting is, you know, part of the DNA of Wisconsin. Uh, but the exciting message that I wanted to share with you and everybody today is just these changes didn't become hatched in cubicles in Madison. This is all about the public input we've had since the deer trustee report, since the governor brought Dr. Kroll and his team in. And a lot of the ideas that we're implementing came straight from the hunting community, landowners, uh, people with forestry interests, as, as well. Getting people excited about moving their ideas forward has been so rewarding for us this year. The exciting thing is we didn't just do the regular go out to communities and do the, the listening sessions like we've done forever. So we really tried incorporating modern technology. So using our social media, um, online surveys, we had well over 10,000 people that contributed their ideas and suggestions and their observations. And that's really what this is about. It's about engaging our partners in conservation, which is primarily the hunting community when we're talking about deer management. And what kind of things do they wanna see under their stands in the coming years? And certainly a lot of these changes are gonna take a little time in order to see some uh, results coming forward. But the exciting thing is people have a seat at the table now in their counties to determine what it is to, that they wanna see in their counties when it comes to deer. So now we're actually partnering with hunters and instead of treating hunters like tools, uh, really having them have a seat at the table with us and kind of be the co-pilot to our pilot when it comes to how we're managing deer. It's a season of opportunity and we're really gonna need our, their feedback. Early and often is gonna be very important. The e-registration system is something else that's new, so we're rolling out that out on a trial uh, basis. Some selected hunters have already received messages about that. We're trying to make it as easy as possible to be out there and participate. So my message is, first of all, always to be safe. That's the number one thing we always wanna stress with folks. Take somebody new hunting, and while we love the youth mentoring programs that are out there and people that are taking young people, it's also important to take older people like myself uh, out into the woods too who maybe haven't done it before. And the women, I'm telling you, my message always to the ladies is you're missing it. If you haven't been out there and you, you haven't been able to participate in just the stillness and the quiet. Sometimes life is so busy now and we just don't have time to stop and appreciate our surroundings and the amazing abundant resources and blessings we've got in Wisconsin. It's really extraordinary. Hunting is an important part of Wisconsin's culture. Our social fabric includes blaze orange and camel. We've known for years that hunters have been the original conservationists who started the green movement, harvesting their own healthy food. Let's not talk about the green in their camel or the greenhead mallards. Let's talk about the greenback dollars that help drive the nation's economy and the Wisconsin economy. New research by the U.S. Census Bureau and others quantifies the important economic benefits generated each year by hunters. 
Nearly 900,000 people, both residents and non-residents, hunt in Wisconsin each year. Those people spend 12 million days hunting in Wisconsin. Hunting supports Wisconsin's economy. Hunter spending supports more than 34,000 jobs in Wisconsin. And hunting generates $1 billion annually in salaries and wages, according to the National Shooting Sports Foundation. The average Wisconsin hunter spends $2,800 each year on the sport. But the yearly spending by hunters in Wisconsin adds up to $2.6 billion. In addition to the license fees, permits, and wildlife stamps they buy, hunters purchase gear that includes a special excise tax under the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act, also known as Pittman-Robertson. That's used to pay for habitat, public hunting land, research, safe shooting ranges open to the public, and other wildlife programs. Wisconsin wildlife and most of the people in the state benefit from this Pittman-Robertson funding voluntarily created by hunters as one more way that they support conservation and the economy. Hunting-related expenditures generate $228 million in taxes each year for Wisconsin, and Wisconsin hunters pay $263 million in federal taxes. The total economic ripple effect of hunting in Wisconsin is $4 billion annually. When hunters buy propane at the local co-op and groceries at the local store, they help support the employees and the owners of those retailers who, in turn, spend their paychecks and profits with other businesses in the communities. Hunting is an extremely valuable part of our heritage and history and our present day economy as well. To learn more about hunting and the economic impact in Wisconsin, visit huntingworksforwi.com. Deer management units, or DMUs, have been one of the cornerstones of deer hunting in Wisconsin for decades. Let's face it, the regulations, tags, season structure, and other components of your deer hunt are influenced by where you are and the unit you hunt in. The importance of DMUs as a data collection and regulations tool hasn't changed, but the boundaries have. And here to tell us about it is DNR big game ecologist Kevin Wallenfang. This really should be a simple change for people to get their heads around. Um, what we've done here is we've basically eliminated a lot of lines on the map. We used to have 130 deer management units and they followed basically roads and rivers around the state. What we've done is just eliminate those and the county that you hunt in, in most cases, is now your deer management unit. So there's nothing new to really learn here. Pretty simple change. So instead of saying I hunt in unit 70A, then I'll say I hunt in the Iowa County unit? Exactly. When you register a deer, you're just gonna tell them what county that you shot that deer in. Uh, we will talk about zones here in a minute as well, but um, you know there are a few exceptions to the rule as far as uh, the forest types and the county where you shot that animal in. Most of that revolves around tribal deer management units in the far north. After all these years, why the change? There's a couple of reasons. Um, one is based on an audit that was done a few years ago of our sex age kill formula. Now most hunters are going to know exactly what the SAK is. It's what we use to estimate deer numbers around the state. And it was reviewed by a panel of experts. Uh, these are people that deal with wildlife population estimating all the time. And they really came to the conclusion that we could have better confidence in our numbers if we increase the size of our deer management units. So for the most part, it's a matter of how much data you can collect. And the more data you can collect within the area that you're looking at, trying to estimate a population in, the higher your confidence levels can be. You know, the one constant that we've always had in deer management is that we've always registered deer by county. So we can apply that county harvest information. We know other things within the county boundaries like the amount of deer habitat that's out there. So we can use the data that we already have by county and we can make the adjustments and come up with new population estimates and things like that for, uh, for the counties. So we're gonna learn a lot this year and we will continue to adjust down the road as we always have. And what about these new hunting zones? What's the story there? Again, the concept of hunting zones is not new for us. So we've always used them to help identify really the season structure. Um, anyone familiar with the CWD management zones or even the old Mississippi River block units, uh, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The hunting zones are used simply to determine when seasons take place. So we use the new zones to help simplify the season structure. We've eliminated the CWD zone. We've created four hunting zones around the state and they generally reflect 
uh, the two most dominant habitat types in the state, which are our forests and our farmlands. So habitats have very distinct characteristics in terms of deer productivity. And by their formation of these zones, we can offer hunting seasons that best address the productivity within that zone. Well, can you give us an example of how this will be better for hunters? Well, I mentioned that we have simplification in mind by using the zone. So you don't have to look back very far, you know, last year itself, uh, to find some of the frustration that hunters have had out there. When they've had to switch back and forth, we had herd control seasons and regular seasons, and then they might switch back again the following year. And you never knew exactly what you were going to get from one year. So we've eliminated those types of seasons. We have a, a consistent season across the state now. Uh, and with the new zones, they know exactly when deer season is, what deer season they're going to have uh, from, from year to year. And, you know, believe it or not, we've reduced the number of deer season structure pages in the hunting regulations from, I think, eight last year down to one single page. Well, let's take a look at these new zones and the seasons then. Sure. You know, a lot has not changed. Uh, we still have a statewide archery season. Uh, this year we have a statewide crossbow season. Uh, we're still going to have a nine-day gun season that's statewide and a muzzleloader season that's statewide. So all of those things still occurring at the times that they always have. The zones really come into play when we start looking at the special seasons. So we used to have a statewide doe season. We don't have that anymore in December. That is now restricted to just the central forest and the central farmland zones. That's been eliminated in the north completely. And then we also have the holiday hunt over the Christmas and New Year's holiday uh, in the southern part of the state, and that is restricted just to the southern farmlands. Here's the DNR's Linda Oliver, along with Mark LaBarbera, to tell you how you can get bonus antlerless deer tags for this season. I understand all deer licenses come with a buck tag and an antlerless tag for the farmland zone. If I fill that antlerless tag, or if I want to hunt in a unit outside the farmland zone, will there be tags available? Yes, if you filled the free farmland zone antlerless tag that comes with your deer hunting license and you'd like to hunt additional antlerless deer in the farmland zones, or if you'd like to hunt antlerless deer in a unit outside of the farmland zones, you can purchase a unit-specific antlerless tag, also known as a bonus tag. 19 county units in part or in whole are designated as buck only and have no bonus tags available to encourage herd growth. Visit dnr.wi.gov for a link to our online licensing site or to find a licensed sales location near you. Bonus tags cost $12 for residents, $20 for non-residents, and $5 for 10 and 11 year olds. Where available, bonus tags may be purchased one per hunter per day until the unit is sold out or the deer season ends. You can only purchase a bonus antlerless tag for yourself. There is an exception, however, for minors. Parents or legal guardians can purchase a bonus antlerless tag for children under the age of 18. The online licensing site is a good option for those that aren't able to leave work in order to buy a bonus antlerless tag. As a rule simplification, CWD management zone and herd control units no longer exist. Therefore, those tags are no longer available. Is the bonus tag weapon or season specific? No, in fact, all antlerless tags, including bonus tags, can be used during any season and filled with any weapon allowed during that season. You'll need to know where you'll be hunting. You'll need to answer up to three questions. Number one, what county do you want the tag for? Number two, if the county's in more than one zone type, forest or farmland, you'll be asked which zone you want the tag for. And number three, you'll need to know if this tag is to be used on public or private land. You can find a deer management zone map in the 2014 deer hunting regulations or on the DNR's deer webpage. Go to dnr.wi.gov and search keyword deer. In the metro subunits where the deer seasons are longer and there's more hunting opportunity, simply select the county and the land type where you'll be hunting. For example, if you want to hunt in a metro subunit in Ozaki County, you'll need to select Ozaki County and then public or private land. The superior metro subunit, however, is unique, and here tags are available specifically for that unit. Why are there public and private land bonus tags? Well, for many years, the department's been asked to develop a method to more closely regulate antlerless harvest on the more heavily hunted public lands in an effort to allow hunters to see more deer and to provide a better hunting experience. For the purpose of purchasing and using a bonus antlerless tag, public land is defined as any land that is open to public hunting, either by ownership or under lease or contract. Public lands include state, federal, county, or municipal lands open for public use, open managed forest law lands or open forest crop law lands open for public hunting, and voluntary public access lands leased for public hunting. 
Any land not covered by these definitions should be considered private land and you'll still need permission to enter. You can find answers to your endless tag questions by calling our DNR call center at 1-888-WDNRINFO. Our call center staff are available seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. In addition, our Dear webpage also has links to more information, including frequently asked questions, maps, and the 2014 Wisconsin deer hunting regulations. Most hunters get started in the sport as youngsters, often joining dad or another relative, first as an observer and then as a full participant. Wisconsin's new mentored hunting program allows kids as young as 10 to actually hunt and take game under the close supervision of an adult mentor. There's another group of hunters that are growing in size. They're being called adult onset hunters, often with no family ties to the hunting tradition. Here's Dick Zilecki of West Dallas to tell us how he became an avid hunter as an adult in his 50s. Back in 1999, I had purchased myself 38 acres out in Vernon County, and uh, I decided to, to build a cabin for the, for the kids and myself, and I spent Two, two years building building the cabin, and I thought to myself, you know, I worked so hard in this cabin, I thought I'd try to enjoy the land a little bit, so I thought to myself, hey, I'll take up deer hunting. And at 55 years old, I'm not so sure that was such a good thing. It's a lot of work. This year, I partnered up with a, a work, work partner of mine, and we went out hunting, and he showed me the ins and outs of the hunting, and how to do it and how to do this and that and the other thing and well one thing led to another and we went out and all I did was freeze so that really didn't help me with uh, my hunting experience one bit I was frozen from way down the bottoms of my feet to the well the top of my hat so I didn't really uh, warm up to that no pun intended so I uh, decided to go out by the pumpkin patch and hunt which is 300 feet away from uh, from the cabin sat down, I looked at my watch, it was 3.51. And I just happened to look to my right, and lo and behold, coming out of the coulee is this, a buck. I was thinking, a, 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 a buck? I was, are you kidding me? I, I, somebody must have it on wheels and pulling up with a rope, because there's no way I'm gonna see this deer. Nobody was seeing anything the whole weekend. Well, I happened to put it up, put the gun up, and got her in my sights, and whammo and let her have it and uh it was it was uh it was a great feeling the deer went down and and uh uh i was i was uh so excited i tried to uh text my buddy in the woods well you know i have a, a an old army phone that still has the wooden crank handle on it with a little <laughs> receiver you, you use i tried to i i text buck buck down buck down well it took me a half an hour to write that with a three-tap phone and the way my hand was shaking. I was so excited. I was, uh, I was, uh, it, was a, it was a good experience. I finally got the message out to him, and he finally came out of the woods and helped me out a little bit and showed me how to gut him. And we hung up in the tree, and I had a grin from ear to ear for the next three days. I still do. <laughs> so it was a great experience. I have no regrets. Wisconsin has one of the most transparent and openly welcoming natural resources agencies in the country when it comes to deer management. And it just got better with the creation of the Deer Management Assistance Program, or DMAP. DMAP is now up and running, and I talked with DMAP coordinator Bob Knack to learn how the program's coming along. So the three core values that the program is based on is, is one that white-tailed deer are an important species here in Wisconsin and should be held in high esteem. Uh, from the social aspects and their traditions of deer hunting to the, to the economic benefits that we have from deer as well. The second one is that uh, wildlife are held for, in the public trust, and so we're managing deer for the benefit of all Wisconsin citizens. And the third is that you know, the habitat improvements you can do for deer on your property are going to benefit a lot of other wildlife species as well. There's uh, three levels. At level one, there's no minimum acreage requirement. Essentially, anybody can join. You'll get technical assistance and information from the department. Uh, get involved with landowner workshops and field days. Level two, the minimum acreage requirement is 160 acres. There is a fee associated with that as well. It's uh, $75 uh, for a three-year agreement. At level two and level three, you get a site visit with professional wildlife biologist and a forester that'll walk your property with you. 
based on the information that they received during that site visit, they'll create a, a management plan for the property as well that you can use to assist you with your habitat objectives. Currently we have over 180 applications now, um, estimate probably over 400 landowners that are involved and the, the interest is there and, and really the department hasn't done a lot of advertising uh, since uh, we closed the applications for 2014. We're working on uh, exactly what this program is going to be and and uh, hopefully uh, after we, we get a year under our belt here, we're really going to open up the doors and move forward. The response I'm hearing from landowners is they really appreciate the communication the department is doing. Every two weeks, landowners receive a, an update on the program as well as technical information they can use. And, and it's ranged from land management techniques to diseases. The other thing that, that our level two and three landowners are really uh, appreciating is the site visits and the opportunity to interact with professionals on the ground, have them walk their property, point out uh, tree species that the landowner didn't even know existed. Next year we plan on opening DMAP um, enrollment for public land as well and, and we have some thoughts on you know trying to increase uh, hunting opportunities for, for the maybe the deer hunter that doesn't own private land themselves. It'll be an, an opportunity to share information between the department and landowners, you know, we can learn from private landowners as well that spend a lot of time on their on their properties. So, I think that's a, a really big benefit that I see of this, and getting neighbors talking to each other about their habitat and deer management goals, and and really kind of bringing people together is is the hope for it. We received applications from a number of uh, landowners that have already formed cooperatives and are working together, and I think it's going to be a good opportunity for us to learn from them and something we can use an example to carry on in the future. I had a chance to look at a DMAP property with landowner James Lanier and wildlife biologist Ron Lichty. Well, James, how long has your family owned this property? My great-grandmother bought the property over 100 years ago. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you've done some work on it, I guess, huh? We've got a, about a five-acre shrub plot where we've got uh, uh, hazelnut, red osier dogwood. We've got plum, crab, spruce trees. Uh, we've got a three-acre prairie that we've also got on the property. So what are you going to be doing here on this property, Ron? Well, specifically, we'll be looking at the things that, that James has already done on his properties and maybe what we can do to enhance some of his objectives for the property. From what you've seen here, what do you think the deer population is on this property? It looks like the deer population is doing you know, okay out here. It's not overpopulated. It's not creating a lot of problems on the landscape or for the habitat right now. So we could probably see it, you know, the population stabilized or actually increase a little bit. Now this is an area where uh, antlerless deer can be taken, right? Yeah, this is in the farmland zone, so antlerless deer can be taken with the, the permits that you when you buy your license, so they will be available that way. There also are um, antlerless tags that through the DMAP program that can be assigned to DMAP landowners or cooperatives. So looking at all those things and meeting the objectives of the landowners or the cooperatives, we can kind of set a quota antlerless tag available for that property. To the south of us, there's a landowner that has 200 acres. And through the DMAP program, I've contacted him for the first time and actually just met him uh, through the program and talked with him about his management goals and how possibly we can work together uh, using the DMAP program. And it's great to work with uh, private landowners as it relates to wildlife issues. So um, James has been one of those guys that he, it's been real great to work with. Uh, I've enjoyed coming out to his property, looking at what he's been doing and, and hopefully coming up with a good management plan in the future to um, enhance that and, and, and create good habitat for both whitetails and other wildlife out here. Matt O'Brien is the Conservation Policy Officer for Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Bureau of Law Enforcement. And Matt, we've already looked at uh, new deer management units and zones and some of the changes regarding antlerless tags, but there are a lot of new rules this year. And What are some of the key ones that hunters need to be aware of? Last year we implemented the, the reduction of the shotgun zones in our state. Um, trying to create some more opportunities so the guys that hunted in kind of the southern corner of the state could use the same weapons that they used up north. Uh, and uh, we got that just in time for last year's hunt. This year now it's going to be fully in effect and uh, guys need to keep that in mind when they're out there uh, so that they can use their rifles 
in the south part of the state, same as they can in the north part. Still need to check into local ordinances to make sure if there's any local restrictions that exist, uh, but that should help create some opportunities, certainly. And along the same lines, we've adjusted another firearms restriction, which was, uh, you know, previously, the day before the nine deer or gun deer season, um, we restricted our archery seasons and, and a new crossbow season and a lot of firearm use for small game and, and target shooting, etc. Uh, this year, we've just kind of opened that up so that uh, the day before is just like any other normal day. And uh, so that should make things a little bit easier for archery hunters that want to get out there and enjoy that, that you know, last uh, shot before the gun hunters get out and certainly should make uh, the firearm users a little bit happier with target shooting and whatnot. And certainly one of our um, changes from last year that will hopefully get a little bit more popularity this year again is our state park hunting opportunities. Uh, we have expanded those. So the state parks uh, and additional state properties are great opportunities. We have maps online. They should check those out. The biggest changes that we're looking for this year, though, uh, is, is how our carcass tags and management zones have changed up a bit. Uh, so what each hunter needs to do is really sit down, just take a few minutes to look at our maps and see exactly what zone you're hunting in, what management unit you're hunting in, and uh, what tags you have so that you can be uh, you know, hunting in an area where you can lawfully harvest an antlerless deer. Uh, because our bonus tags you know, specify public or private lands and uh, you know, specific units and such. So they just need to take a minute to look at that and make sure they understand exactly what's going on and uh, you know, be safe for everybody that's out there, of course. Remember, these rules, along with everything else we present in this show, are available on the DNR website, on the Wisconsin Pocket Ranger mobile app, and in the regulations booklet. And if you still have questions, you can call the DNR toll-free information number seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., even during deer season, and get your questions answered in English, Spanish, or Hmong. As of this year, it's legal for anyone to hunt deer with a crossbow during any open deer season. But prior to this year, only hunters with certain disabilities could use a crossbow. And Jimmy Spataro was one of those hunters, and he's got quite a story. Jimmy, you got started as a hunter rather late in life, didn't you? Yeah, Dan, I was uh, a golfer for 49 years. And I have a disease from an accident, caused by an accident, and I had to give up golf. And I was watching TV, and I saw Jim Shockey, and uh, I thought, you know, maybe I could try this sport. And I thought maybe I could try the bow hunting. I looked at crossbows. I picked the 10 point because it had a crank on it that I could very easily cock the bow. Mm -hmm. And I was a hunter. Well, Jimmy, tell us how you got this buck. It was a very nice day. It was 55 degrees. I, Linda sprayed me down and, it, it, you know, and wished me good luck. And I went, she went to bed and I went to the deer stand. And about 3.30, the weather changed, and it got cool, and I, I was starting to get a lot of pain in my body from my fibromyalgia. And I said, maybe I should go in, and I went, no, nah, this is the prime time. At 4.04, about 30 yards from me, over a ridge, walks this beautiful deer. And I kind of crouched, and I was holding the crossbow, crouched. My knees started to shake. And as they were shaking, the deer turned his head a different way. And I was able to stand up straight. And he kept walking straight at me. Never knew I was there. And all of a sudden, he turned dead broadside. And I nailed him perfectly. I hit him. I got lung and heart. So I got down. Oh my god. Never saw a deer this big. It was really not until Linda and I came back in the house, and she took the chip out of the camera. And the first picture that came up showed me holding the deer straight on. And I went, oh my God, is that deer tall? I've got a tr magnificent trophy. I've had lots of honors and I got a nice recognition. I guess I'm going to be number one in the record book for the Buck and Bear Club. Brian Tessman was the lead scorer on it. And they scored it 179 and 1 8 net. For the extended story of Jimmy's hunt, Log on to the Deer Hunt Wisconsin YouTube page. Talking with Kevin Wallenfang again. Kevin, we're all accustomed to loading our deer in the truck or on a trailer and hauling them to a registration station and then back to camp or home or a meat processor. But some hunters are saying it's about time Wisconsin switched over to electronic deer registration. You hunt around the country, you've seen this work elsewhere. In fact, we're already doing it here for turkeys and geese. Tell us how it's going to be implemented here in Wisconsin. Well, Dan, what we're doing is we're trying to look at the best of the states out there. 
And uh, you know, we're one of the few states in the Midwest that doesn't have electronic registration. And you know, we want to see what other states are doing, what works best for them, what works best for their hunters, and then try to mold that into the Wisconsin system. Okay, so what are you going to do? Well, there's uh, a couple of different phases actually to implementation of this thing. And we've started that with the 2014 deer season. So what we've done is we've sent a letter out to about 200 people per county uh, that regularly register deer. And they get to use this new system this year. And there's a couple of different components of the system. It includes online registration, which takes about two minutes. It's very quick. There's a telephone system just like we have for turkeys. And then we still do have the, uh, the regular registration stations out there. So the vast majority of people this fall are going to take their deer to a registration station as they always have for many decades um, and do it like they always have. But that select few out there, um, they're already using the system. Um, as of early October, we've had about a thousand deer registered with the new system. And we've already made tweaks based on some of the feedback that we're getting from those hunters. And what will happen next year? Next year, the plan right now is that we will go full implementation. Everybody will get to use the new system. So again, they're going to have the online system, the telephone system. Um, and you know, one of, the, one of the worries for a lot of people out there is that the old tradition of going to a registration is going to go away. They're still going to uh, be able to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, we could have many more walk-in registration opportunities. Any business out there, uh, as long as they're willing to offer the telephone or, you know, throw a laptop computer up on the tavern, uh, on the bar or at the, uh, at the archery shop, whatever it might be, somebody can still walk in and register that deer. All right. Well, Kevin, while we've got you here, let's uh, talk about the forecast for this year's hunt. Last winter was one of the most brutal we've had in decades, and it had to have an impact on the herd. Yeah, in fact, it was the most uh, brutal, if you want to use the word brutal, uh, uh, winter that we've had ever since really? we've been taking winter severity indexes. Mm -hmm. So it certainly had an impact. Um, you know, that was two years back to back. And uh, the, the previous year probably did more damage as far as losses went. We actually heard from more people the year before, but that makes sense. With fewer deer on the landscape, uh, we wouldn't hear as much last year. But um, certainly it was a tough winter, and uh, we have responded to that with zero quotas. Uh, so no doe shooting in uh, 19 counties in part or in whole. And most of those are across the far north in our forested region. All right, so hunters are facing bucks only in a lot of the north. What about the uh, farmland regions? Farmland region, we are seeing a lot of deer. Um, the hunters, uh, early in the season here, the bow hunters are doing quite well, uh, it seems. And folks are telling us they're just seeing an awful lot of deer. So we expect some fantastic deer hunting in the farmland region this year. Uh, everybody out there that buys a tag still gets a free doe tag that can be used anywhere in the farmland regions. Um, there are a few tags in the forest, central forest region um, but deer numbers are down there in a lot of places, and so uh, they're going to see fewer deer this year uh, across the north in most places. You know, it's a given. There's no doe tags out there. Our harvest is going to go down this year, no question about it, in the north, uh, but we expect a good season in the south. We all have special places that we cherish in Wisconsin, but now you can do something to help those places thanks to the Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin and its Cherish Wisconsin initiative. This campaign helps set aside funding from voluntary contributions from people like you to help maintain those public lands and waters for future generations. Now, here's a story from a couple of people who want to share their places that they cherish in Wisconsin. The places I most cherish are in southwestern Wisconsin. I regularly kayak the canoe trail at Wyalusing, but perhaps my favorite memory is my first time deer hunting, public lands on the Wisconsin River. Early morning, cold, hiking for hours, finally finding that one deer, and of course not taking the shot because I was so startled. That's my favorite places. Hi, my name is Vic Wiemet. I've lived in northern Wisconsin almost my whole life. I cherish the many memories I have of growing up in northern Wisconsin, deer hunting with my parents and my older brothers when I was hardly able to walk. I also cherish the many memories I have of hunting and fishing and camping with my children and my grandkids. Uh, I remember a trip of camping on an island on the Turtle Flambeau Floyd 40 years ago with my oldest son, Nate, who was 12 at the time. Last summer, 
we camped on an island in the Turtle Flamel Floyd with nine of my grandkids, ages six through 16. It was an experience I will cherish and remember my whole life, and I hope they will too. I think one of the best legacies we can leave our children and grandchildren is a love of nature and a love for the outdoors. I will cherish those memories that I have had forever in beautiful Wisconsin outdoor playground. We've already talked about ways you can get involved in deer management, but there's one more way, and it's a big one. New this year is the formation of stakeholder groups called County Deer Advisory Councils. And here to tell us about them is Rob Bowman. He's the chairman of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. Rob, what's the makeup of these councils? The members of the council are basically made up of somebody that represents the transportation, somebody from agricultural, somebody from forestry, somebody from the tribes in the northern counties. We have a member from the Conservation Congress delegate who typically the chair or somebody, one of the local delegates in that committee. We also have the secretary being another Congress delegate as well. And then we have some liaisons from the department, which will be law enforcement, forestry, and biologists to assist these councils. The councils are to work with the public and listen to the public and work on their management perspective, goal perspectives in their county, whether that's to increase the deer herd, decrease the deer herd, or stabilize the deer herd. They're getting their information from the metrics that are in each county. Those metrics are basically the re past kills, past harvest numbers, whether it's archery, firearms, muzzle loading, or youth hunt. They're also going to look at population objectives as far as where is it at. Right now, a lot of counties are at 15 deer per square mile, 20 per deer per square mile, 25 deer per square mile. They're going to look at the history from the last 15 to 20 years in each county to make recommendations on if they want to increase, stabilize, or decrease the deer herd. Those recommendations will be presented to, to the department. The department will take those recommendations before the board. The department will also be bringing their own recommendations to the board and the Natural Resources Board will have the opportunity to weigh the options and make the final decision. The meeting in September was basically an introduction and to go over their charges in each county. The meetings in October when they met in October was to make their recommendations on increase, decrease or stabilize the deer herd. They'll be meeting again in December and then meeting again in January or February. Their recommendations go to the department. The department will review those recommendations. They will then forward it on to the Natural Resources Board along with the department's recommendations. The board will look at the recommendations coming from the councils and the department and make their final recommendations for each county. The public is welcome to every meeting. My intent is to have the final recommendations coming out of these councils to be presented to the public and get any final input that the public may have and if they need to make some final changes to the recommendations they can do so next spring before it goes to the board. The public has an opportunity if they don't attend the meetings to voice their opinion. They can have the opportunity to go online if they go to the Department of Natural Resources website and punch in CDAC which stands for County Deer Advisory Councils It'll bring them to the web page and there'll be an opportunity for them to go on there and they can comment on there as well. So what's your hope for the outcome of this process? The biggest thing is putting management back into the public. We've heard for years that the public wasn't satisfied, they weren't happy with the deer season structures that we've had in the past, especially down in the CWD areas. We had hunters that were, we were listening to the complaints. Now we're giving the public an opportunity to be a part of the process and to be a partner work with the Congress, work with the department, and be partners. It's our natural resources. Let's work together with the natural resources. We've come to Mech Reloaders in Mayville, Wisconsin, and I'm talking with Sean Wozniak about reloading shotgun slugs. Now, Sean, why would someone want to reload shotgun slugs when you only shoot a couple a year? Some, some don't shoot much, but some do. Each gun's different. There's different performances with different, different guns. So you can customize a round for your gun, be more accurate, and be able to harvest game with one shot, which is the main goal. It's very cost effective also. Right now, it's about $20 a box for five shells. So every time you pull the trigger, that's $4 going out the barrel. Where you can reload, you're saving about a dollar to less than a dollar per shot. All right, well, why don't you show us how you do it? The first station, what we're gonna do is deprime, resize, 
You saw the primer, old primer get kicked out. We're going to take a new primer, drop it in station two. We have our new live primer into it. Station three, charge bar off to the left, back off to the right. We dropped our powder charge in. We're going to take our sabot, drop it into the shell, pull the handle to feel a little pressure. That means the sabot is sitting on top of the powder. We're going to have a good seal. Move it into the crimping station. This crimping station forces the plastic down and into the shell. The next crimping station is going to force the plastic on the outside of the round. And then the last crimping station puts the radius on the shell. The radius is very important, especially with semi-autos. You want to make sure you have the radius on the shell so it cycles through the gun. So now this is a finished round? It is a finished round. Well, Sean, you talked about customizing. How do you go about that, or why would you do it? A little bit with the customization is there's a lot of women and youth coming into the market. And the factory rounds that, that are available have a lot of recoil. So we want to make sure that, that it's, a, it's a fun hunting experience and not a painful one in the shoulder. So main thing is, when you start out reloading, you want to follow the recipe book. You start there as a starting point. From there, you can always back it off a little bit to reduce the recoil. What kind of pattern can you expect when you customize? When you customize, obviously, we're, we're going to shrink the pattern. Prime example would be this target right here. This was shot at just 25 yards, just testing the ammunition. But you can see here, we're, we're holding about a one and a half inch group of slugs. Once we back out to 50 and 100, the group may open up, but that's where reloading is nice to have. We can customize it and shrink the group back if need be. All right, well, that's great. Thanks a lot for showing it to us. Thank you for stopping in and seeing us today, Dan. Whether you think the changes in deer management we've been talking about are a good idea or a bad one, Wisconsin was due for some of them. The Deer Trustee Report became the jumping off point for these changes, so we thought it only fair to go to the source, Wisconsin's Deer Trustee, Dr. James Kroll, to ask for his thoughts on how the transition is coming along. Wisconsin's a special place. You got a special deer herd, you got a special hunting tradition, you got a special place all, all the way around. Wisconsin represents an incredible opportunity to really do the job right when it comes to deer management. And that's the whole job of this, of this report and implementation is to make things great for the average deer hunter. The DNR has, have, have just gripped this thing with open arms and they're, they're excited, the public's excited, and the speed at which they've got it done and a deliberate speed has just been impressive. You know, one of our recommendations was to simplify regulations to, I think I used the term, to put the fun back in deer hunting. And that's another thing I'm very encouraged about is the, the department is make, making uh, serious efforts to move towards simplification of regulations. And that's going to be a big part of putting that fun back into it. And, and I hope the hunters understand that that's a process that takes time. There's legislative processes, there, there are rule processes that have to take place, and sometimes they don't take place as fast as people would like to see them. Part of the implementation plan involves a long-term strategy to improve the way deer are managed and improve the hunting conditions for Wisconsin. So it's going to take a little while and it's going to take a commitment from the hunters as well as the DNR and the landowners. Everybody are going to have to work together. Most experienced hunters know how to field dress deer, but if you've never done it before, where do you start? Let's join Dan again as he field dresses two deer, a buck and a doe, during last year's gun deer season. There are a number of ways to field dress a deer. We've got a nice adult buck and a good sized doe here, and I'll show you how I do it. Real Avid makes a couple of knives that make the job real easy. This one is called the Revelation. It's got two LED lights, one on each side of the blade, and it is very handy for field dressing a deer in low light conditions if you get one late in the afternoon. The other tool is actually three tools in one. It's called a viscera. It's a field dressing blade and skinning blade. And also, you push a little button and you get a gut hook and a saw for opening the brisket. This is the tool I'm going to use. And before I get started, I always put on a pair of field dressing gloves. You can get these at just about any sporting goods store. But the surgeon's glove goes right over the top of that. 
and we're all set. Now the first cut I always make is at the other end of the deer, so if you come around with me, I'll show you how we get started. And the first cut is actually right around the anal opening. Now you can just cut off the genitals if you want to. If you remove them like this, you'll actually be able to pull them back through the body cavity with the rest of the entrails. We'll come up to the brisket and find the bottom of the breastbone. And I'm going to make a puncture, not too deep. You take the gut hook, find that opening, and it's basically just like unzipping the deer. Now, back to the knife, and I'm going to go up into the rib cage and cut the diaphragm. You want to cut that as close to the rib cage as possible. And while I'm here, I'm going to go up and loosen the lungs and the heart. Now we finish cutting around the diaphragm, we should be able to roll all the entrails right out. Back to the third use of this tool. If you cut the brisket a little bit, you can spread the body cavity out and it helps cool the meat off. Let them drain a little bit. And I don't leave these in the woods. Pack them out with you. That's all there is to it. Hi, I'm Jennifer Stingline. I work for the Department of Natural Resources, the Bureau of Science Services, as a research scientist. And I want to tell you about Snapshot Wisconsin. Snapshot Wisconsin is a new research program, and it came out of the Deer Trustee Report. And there are four reasons why we're doing this project. The first is for partnership with citizens of the state and educators to involve everyone in wildlife monitoring. A second is to understand the distribution and abundance of carnivores across the state of Wisconsin. Also to come up with new innovative ways to monitor wildlife populations. And finally, to have a better understanding of deer in the state and also give us different ways to monitor deer. So in Wisconsin, we have lots of townships along a grid, and those are six miles by six miles. We'll be cutting each one into four pieces, so have survey blocks that are three miles by three miles, and asking classrooms and teachers, citizens of the state, interest groups, also maybe Boy Scout troops and anyone else who's interested to sign up for those survey blocks, attend a training session, and then put a DNR sponsored camera somewhere in that survey block. We then ask them to monitor that camera all year round, collect the pictures from that camera, and then submit those pictures to the DNR. Already this year, we started a pilot study for Snapshot Wisconsin where we had 80 cameras out in a north to south gradient and had them out for at least 90 days. We captured all sorts of pictures of wildlife and ended up with more than 100,000 pictures from that study. From there, those pictures would go on a crowdsourcing website where people from all across the world would help us categorize what sort of animals are in those pictures. These are the data that we'll then use to increase our understanding of all sorts of wildlife in Wisconsin and how they're distributed across the state. If they're in the northern part of the state, the southern part of the state, and, and how many there are throughout, and also how their distribution changes throughout the year. These pictures will be around forever. There'll be an opportunity for us to catalog wildlife in the state and also see changes through time. So we really hope that you stay tuned. A good way to do that is to go to the DNR website, type in the keyword Snapshot Wisconsin, and put in your email address where you can then get updates. We really hope that you'll be interested in being involved in this project. It's going to really help us understand all sorts of animals across the state. Todd Schaller is the new Chief Conservation Warden for Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And Todd, there are so many new rules this year. How are the wardens going to handle enforcing them? We're really going to focus on education, um, education before the season, making sure the hunters know the rules going in 
And then when we come across situations, you know, making sure we, we communicate and educate uh, the hunters uh, during those contacts. And uh, if someone is caught in a violation, I suppose they're going to get a ticket. Right? It really depends, and that, that depends upon any violation, even, even laws that have been around for a long, long time. You know, we look at the individual's circumstance and situation, and, you know, the wardens have discretion on how they need to and, and want to handle that. Um, obviously, if, if there's some knowing and intentional aspect of it, that typically ends up in a citation. But if it's, you know, people make mistakes, we understand that, and we try to address it at the, the appropriate level. What do you think might be uh, a problematic new rule that people would have trouble with? You know, I, I think that probably the biggest change is the, 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 the variety of tags that are available. Um, that's going to be a, a challenge for the hunters to kind of understand. And then this, you know, this private land, public land, um, going back to the county um, deer management unit structure. Um, so those are some of the changes that, you know, we're focusing on our education with. And uh, those are some problem probably some areas we're going to come across more frequently in the field. What are you telling people as you're going around the state, um, conservation groups and others, what are you telling them about the new rule? You know, the biggest thing is to not look at the state as a whole, to really focus on your individual area that you hunt. Because um, if you look at that pamphlet and start reading through it and then think, oh my goodness, I'll, I'll never get my head around this. Um, but if you look down and say, I'm going to hunt in, in X county and, and really focus on that, I think the rules are fairly simple. They're new, they're changed, but I think you, the hunter will be able to get their head around it and understand it. What are you hearing from hunters about their thoughts or response to the new rules? I think a lot of them are, are maybe just first starting to learn them and, and hear about them. So they're asking questions. You know, we're, we're directing a lot of people to our, our website. Um, there's a lot of great information out there for people to become educated on. Um, and I think, you know, they're, they look at it holistically, as I mentioned, but I think our focus is get down to where you hunt, and I think they'll have a, a good understanding. I imagine the call center is going to be pretty busy with uh, hunters calling in with their questions, but there's also a tip line for DNR, isn't there? There is a tip line. Uh, it's 1-800-TIP-WDNR, and that's uh, the method that any hunter can report a violation that they may see 24 hours a day, 365 days out of the year. So we encourage hunters to do that if they see problems or violations out in the field. The other thing it can be used for is if a hunter, you know, makes a mistake and realizes it and, and they can call in the hotline and self-report. The fact that that hunter is, is honest and ethical um, certainly plays into the, the final outcome. It's about, you know, the hunters having a positive experience, being part of the management of our deer herd in Wisconsin, uh, having a safe season. Kevin, earlier in the show, we talked about uh, private and public antlerless tags, what's the reason, the philosophy behind this new system? Well, the whole idea of splitting public land tags and private land tags out separately when we set antlerless quotas during the year and then issuing permits afterward is that, um, you know, over the years we hear all the time that the public lands get hunted very, very hard and guys see very, very few deer out there. And they're right. In a lot of cases that is the situation, especially when you get into smaller properties. So the whole idea behind this was to try to come up with a way that we could allocate permits out there that would reduce harvest on small public properties and increase the harvest on the private properties. Now, that's always a challenge, getting onto private property. So uh, I'm, I'm not so sure that we're gonna be able to, in, this is gonna help us increase the harvest on the private lands, but on the public lands, we're hoping that it can help us kind of back off a little bit. The whole idea here is to give somebody more of a quality hunting experience. And everything that people tell us in surveys and whatnot says their top mark of a quality experience is to see more deer. So if this works as intended to work, um, we are hopefully going to see a couple of years of decreased harvest on the public properties and hopefully that will result in people seeing more deer and a more quality hunting experience. Well, under this new system then, if I shoot a deer on, say, private land and it goes on to public land or vice versa, what happens? Well, you're going to put the tag on the deer where the deer was standing when you shot it, okay. okay? So this is not a new situation. We've always had a situation in the past where you had a tag for, say, unit 68A, and the deer was wounded, it ran across the highway into 68B, what would you do? Well, you would have uh, tracked that deer down, put your 68A tag on it. So this is really not a new situation. It may be a little bit more common now, though, because they're not crossing roads and whatnot. So if... Uh, uh, somebody's hunting on a piece of public property 
and the deer runs off onto private property, first and foremost, you still have to get permission to enter that private property. So that's your first goal. Um, but again, you're gonna put the tag on that animal where it was standing when you shot it. Uh, so if it runs over onto the private property, it came off a of public property, you're gonna put your public land tag on it. Makes a lot of sense. It does. Well, Mark, we sure look sharp in this realistic camo, but I wouldn't want to wear it in the woods. No, but after the hunt, it looks great. It certainly does. Well, that about wraps it up for another deer hunting special. We've covered a lot of ground, and we don't expect you'll remember all these changes, especially if it's the first time you've heard them. Remember, they're all summarized in the deer regulations pamphlet, and they're available online at dnr.wi.gov, keyword deer hunting. They're also available via the smartphone app, Wisconsin Pocket Ranger, available as a free download from the DNR website, the Apple App Store, or Google Play. And if you still have questions, you can get them answered in English, Spanish, or Hmong, seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. by calling the number on your screen or via an online chat. I'm Dan Small. On behalf of all of us who worked on this show, we wish you a safe and successful deer season, and be sure to join us again next year for another episode of Deer Hunt Wisconsin. Well, we've got another. The rules have changed, but the tradition remains. Ah, throat, throat, throat. For his chairman, chairman, is that what it is? Chairman. <laughs> Here's a tip. Dan did. On behalf of all of us who worked on this show, we wish you a safe and successful deer season. Did I say season? How did I do that? Places to hunt on public land, new... <sighs> I'm done. That's good. Uh, but...